Hey, folks, uh, I am Jeff Edgers, the national arts reporter at The Washington Post. This is Washington Post Live. And uh, we got a good one for you. Uh, I wish it could go on all day, but we're going to have to pack it in to this Washington Post Live. Dave Grohl, uh, who, as you all know, because I know you're counting, 16 Grammy Awards. He's won an Emmy. I think he has a Tony. Uh, and now he has written this book, which um, the storyteller, uh, Tales of Life and Music. And I'm going to tell you, um, I read a lot of memoirs. I read a lot of rock memoirs. And this is a special book. It's, first of all, packed with detail and storytelling, but also it's kind of a way to live. So, uh, Dave, welcome uh, welcome to the program. How are you today? Jeff, how are you? I'm good. I'm in New York City, and it's another beautiful day. Yeah, I'm in Massachusetts in this D damn barn and it's uh, dark and rainy but look i read your book and uh, you're you're very modest but um this book is seven 374 pages long but more than that uh i just want to read one little quick passage because it i think sums up you and also the way we should live you go into a famous uh you go see a, a couple of rock stars you're at a benefit concert for sandy and you see in one corner a guy whose teeth are like uh, chiclets. I'm paraphrasing here. I don't want to read the whole book. And in the other corner, you see a guy uh, with gray hair, deep lines, scowl, teeth that could have belonged to George Washington. Uh, and, and this is what you write. Uh, I decided right then and there that I would become the latter, that I would celebrate the ensuing years by embracing the toll they'd take on me, that I would aspire to become the rusted out hot rod no matter how many jump starts I might require along the way. Beautifully written, lays out everything. Um, Thanks. Jim. I want you to start out by telling me about why you actually wrote a book. You seem busy enough. Well, last year when uh, the pandemic hit and everything shut down, um, I was left with nothing to do. And I never have nothing to do. And I kind of panicked. I mean, I kind of thought, Oh my God, what, I, we just, Foo Fighters had just finished making a record. We had made videos and documentaries and things. And then I was just left sitting there and I'm kind of creatively restless. So I'm always looking for something to do. So I started this Instagram page called Dave's True Stories uh, with just the intention of writing these funny little anecdotal stories about crazy things that have happened to me. Maybe like not only to give me something to do, but to give the the reader, like maybe four or five minutes of happiness or a, just a giggle, you know? And as I was doing that, and I realized that the pandemic was, this lockdown was gonna be a bit longer than expected. I thought, okay, maybe now is the time to write a book. And I had made this list of like 30 or 40 stories that I was gonna use for the Instagram page. And I just handed those to a publisher and said, okay, you pick which stories you want me to write. I started writing and I really fell in love with the process. Um, and it was, it was very similar to, each story is really similar to uh, writing a song, the composition, there's like a verse, there's a chorus, there's a hook. But as I was writing these stories, it was almost like making an album. Putting them all together was not unlike sequencing an album where as you record more and more, you realize what you are missing and where to fill out those spaces so that the sequence of the songs in an entire album makes sense. So it was just, you know, it was very, it was, it was, it was fun. I had a blast. Fun, that is not what people always say about writing, um, but, uh, but you can feel it coming through in these pages. Um, and, you know, uh, w one thing, I, and one other thing I wanna quote of yours is, uh, and I think this is another thing that makes people like you, which is, there's a section where you talk about all of these different uh, uh, brushes with fame that you've had over the years. Um, and you say, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and I take none of it for granted. Um, that I think is your philosophy as a rock star, am I right? Yeah, well, I mean, you have to also understand that um, growing up in Springfield, Virginia, just outside of DC, that was not a hotbed of rock and like future rock and rollers. It was just like this little white picket fence suburban existence. Um, and I loved music. I loved rock and roll. And I had albums and I had these posters on my walls of, you know, ACDC and Led Zeppelin and Kiss and things like that. It seemed kind of unattainable. 
So it just sort of seemed like this fantasy world. And then once I discovered uh, the first show I ever went to was actually this punk rock band that um, was playing in this corner bar in Chicago, this band called Naked Ray Gun. And all of that mythology just sort of went away. Like all of the fantasy and the lasers and the smoke machines and the dragons and the castles. It was like, there were these four guys on stage with a few amplifiers and a few lights and they knew like four chords and they started playing and it was real. It was so raw. I was like, oh my God, this is rock and roll. And it did feel attainable. It was like, I, I know those four chords, I can do it. So the foundation of everything that I've done uh, is, is that, just the simple practice of playing music um, and then going on tour in a van and spending years with my friends playing squats and sleeping on floors and things like that. That really makes you appreciate all of the things that come after. So when I'm face to face with little Richard, it's like, I cannot believe this is happening. Or when I'm <laughs> hanging out with ACDC, like dancing to the Preservation Hall jazz band, I can't believe this is happening. And I'm still, I still feel like the kid on my bedroom floor learning to play music, listening to Beatles records, you know, and then I'm jamming with McCartney on the Grammys or whatever. Like, it just blows my mind that this is actually real. And I'm so incredibly grateful and thankful. It's like, I have to pinch myself because I never expected it would happen. And then as it happens, I'm like, I can't believe this is up. This is crazy. Like how, who gets to do this? This is insane. Every day I feel that way. Uh, Dave, I, by the way, I've assembled in my office. You, you can see over my shoulder, I've got McCartney, Foo Fighters, first record, Iggy Pop, and I have the famous eight track of uh, your most recent Foo Fighters record. It's a little hard to point to things. Um, so, uh, you know, Virginia, you, you know, and growing up in the suburbs of D.C., um, it was interesting. I had a conversation, a brief conversation with my wife this morning as we were getting the kid ready for school. And she said, uh, do you think Dave would be uh, uh, famous or would he have done the Foo Fighters without Nirvana? And I said, uh, I said, uh, get him a sandwich. And then I said, um, I actually think uh, it's his mom. Uh, I'm not sure you would have been famous or successful or whatever without Virginia, not the state, but your mom, because there are moments in your uh, history. First of all, she takes you to uh, One Step Down, the jazz club in D.C. Um, she seems to give you a sort of freedom. Your parents are divorced at that point. And she uh, you call her up and tell her, hey, I'm going to quit high school to join Scream. And what does she tell you? She said, you better be good. I mean, she, I think the reason why um, she allowed me a lot of this freedom was because she was a public school teacher for 35 years. So she had like kind of a deeper understanding of how uh, the mind of a child works. Um, she'd spent decades helping kids to learn and understood that no two kids learn the same. Um, some kids really excel in school and do very well. Other kids uh, might not, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're failures. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not smart. It's just, I think, the method of learning. And I was a terrible student. I, I didn't do well in school at all. But she recognized something in me that gave her this faith that I would be able to survive outside of that conventional sort of uh that conventional schooling system and so and she and she saw how much i loved music and the dedication that i that i put into it because even if i was teaching myself to play the drums on pillows on my bedroom floor i would do it for like four hours a day you know and even though i was kind of like learning to play guitar by listening to records i would do it for four hours a day and i was not doing my homework four hours a day i was doing this and my mother who's also a musician back in the 50s she sang in acapella groups she understood that love of music and i think she kind of put two and two together and realized i think i think she realized if i were going to learn italian it would take me going to Italy with my punk rock band and sleeping in squats, learning the language just to ask, where's the pharmacy? <laughs> you know, where's, where's the toilet? Uh, where's the food? What, help, help, you know? So, um, so she, she had faith in me and she, she really did allow me the freedom to just become the person that I wanted to become, which I, I am so thankful and grateful for that.
I mean, you're you're in this band Scream, which people may or may not be familiar with, but um, hardcore DC band. These guys are older than you are. You greatly respect them. You've got a good thing going, but it's starting to collapse. And you call her from a payphone. And again, uh, you, you've been asked if you could join Nirvana, uh, this little group up in uh, I don't know where it was. Uh, and you're asked to to join them. And uh, you're not sure what to do. You you love your friends. You don't want to betray them. What does your mother tell you at that point? Well, it was kind of a desperate time. I mean, we had gone on this tour. We were stuck in Los Angeles. Um, one of the members of the band just kind of disappeared, just went home. And um, so we were stranded. And I had this offer to join a band and continue playing music. And at the time, Nirvana wasn't Nirvana. Um, they had an album called Bleach that came out on the label Sub Pop. And, you know, they were greatly respected in the underground scene, but it wasn't, it didn't really seem like this crazy career move. And so I just had the, uh, the, an offer to, uh, the opportunity to go play with a band that I, that I liked. But I was torn because, you know, the guys in my band, we were very close. We were close friends and we'd been through so much together. So I did, I called my mother and I asked for her advice, which I would do often. And um, she, the most altruistic, generous, giving person I've ever met in my entire life, said, you know, sometimes you have to do what's best for you, which surprised me coming from her. I don't think she, it, it wasn't until recently. And as I was writing the book that I I realized maybe what she was referring to was um, when we were young, I think that um, our parents, you know, realized they weren't going to make it. And in order for us all to survive, they needed to split. And so I think maybe in that case, my mother did what was best for her. So when she told me uh, the same thing, I, I, I could only agree because all the advice she'd ever given me was, was, was just so spot on. So I did. I, I took my duffel bag and my drums and I went up to Seattle. Dave, does your, uh, uh, is it possible if, if Virginia says, uh, Dave, uh, terrible idea. These are your buddies. Uh, I know the corn dogs are getting tiring, but uh, stay with Scream. Do you not join Nirvana? Is that possible? That is very possible. If my mother would have, would have told me that, we, we probably wouldn't be here on Washington Post Live right now. <laughs> Uh, folks, I just want to let my bosses know that is our headline today. Because of mom, there was a Nirvana. So Nirvana, uh, I didn't actually even mention them in the introduction, which says something, I think. But um, it was interesting. My wife, again, we talk all the time. And she said, is there a lot about Kurt in the book? And I said, well, there is stuff about Kurt, but I think there's more about his daughters. I think there's more about Jimmy. Uh, I'm not sure I gave her all that information, but I, you know, that's what I was thinking. Uh, you've been very particular in how you've talked about Kurt Cobain over the years, and I'm wondering uh, uh, how you dealt with this. I know your book editor, Carrie Thornton, is a very tasteful, smart person, but I imagine for years people were saying, Dave, write the Kurt Cobain book. Uh, you know, here's $5 billion. How did you deal with this in, the, in this situation? Um, well, first of all, like I said earlier, we were <clears throat> kind of choosing these stories, not in any sort of chronological order, but by emotional relevance or importance. So obviously, um, Kurt was going to be a part of the book um, in that, in how important um, our time together was. So it was a pretty short period of time, you know, from the time I joined the band to the time Nevermind came out. I mean, I think it was maybe like four years or from the time I joined the band to the time the band ended. It was about four years. And um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of knew what people wanted me to write. I kind of knew what people maybe expected me to write. But instead of doing that, you know, I wanted to focus on a much more, a much broader emotional uh, picture. And so the chapter in which I write about Kurt passing, you know, I, I, that was the last piece I wrote because I was kind of afraid to write it. You know, I was like, Oh God, how am I going to, how am I going to say this? How am I going to do this? How can I put this into words? And um, I decided to, to talk about uh, grief and mourning and 
loss and the process of uh, healing um, and how that's different with each person that you lose and how that's determined. Is it determined by time or is it determined by the depth of the relationship? So, um, you know, when I started writing the book, I, I wasn't sure. I'd, I, there was a part of me that hoped I had enough to write. And I'd st- I kept writing and kept writing and kept writing. I finally got to maybe 300 pages. And I don't even know if I'd mentioned the Foo Fighters yet. I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> what am I doing? And it got to the point where Carrie was like, stop writing, stop writing, stop writing. Like, it was just too much to put in one book. So the challenge really was, um, was which stories to include. Um, and, and that was difficult. But obviously, my time in Nirvana and um, the stuff about Kurt was, was very important to the story. And some of it was a pleasure to write. Some of it was really difficult. And, um, um, but I, th- I think we, we put it all together well. You, you still uh, find it hard to sit in the drums and play Nirvana songs, right? That still creates a sort of trauma for you. Well, it's different now. I mean, um, 25 years ago, yes, it was, it, was, it, was, it was difficult just to sit down at the drums and play. Uh, much less play a Nirvana song. But over the years, you know, Chris Novoselic and Pat Smear and I have gotten together a few times. And, you know, I think over time it becomes more of a celebration of that music. Um, and like it's almost like you're paying tribute to it, to it or honoring it. You always feel like there's something missing if you sit down and play those songs. You know that someone is missing. Um, and it's funny how the muscle memory works just to sit down and play any song that we used to play in Nirvana. It comes back like that. Um, I think that's how like deeply ingrained that whole experience was to all of us. But, you know, there have been a few times where we've done it and we, it's bittersweet. You know, we look at each other and we're reminded of this great music that we made, but you know, there's someone missing. So we don't do it. We don't do it often, but when we do, it means a lot. You know, I hear this over and over when you talk about Foo Fighters, which is, um, I think Conan O'Brien was asking about it because you went to his show at one point and just played a whole set that no one saw on camera. And you said, but we like playing. This is, <laughs> this is what we, we like to do. And, uh, and that's the thing that's, I think, important about this group. Um, you enjoy what you do. You love it. Is, is this the band forever? Is this like in, is this like the equivalent of the Rolling Stones that we, we just see you in 30 years up there on stage playing? I don't know. You know, for the longest time, when we first started the band, there was the first record. And then we thought, okay, let's do one more. And we did the second record. And we're like, all right, let's do one more. We did another. For the first maybe five records, we thought, okay, just, let's do one more. Let's make it good. It might be our last. Let's just do one more. At some point, it changed to like, like your grandparents getting divorced. Like, it's just not gonna happen. You know what I mean? You've been, <laughs> they've been together this long. You, 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 they can't get a divorce. They're in their eighties, you know? So, um, at the, you know, it's been 26 years with the Foo Fighters. And when you've been together that long, it kind of becomes more than a band. You know, it's, it's, it's basically a group of families um, that have created this little world for ourselves and music is included. Um, outside of that, it's, it's, it's just as a group of friends who've known each other more than half their lives would, uh, would exist together. So I'd imagine that, um, we won't stop anytime soon, but I think if I go solo now, I can get into the hall of fame when I'm for the third time when I'm 77. Is that right? 70. Yeah, 77. So we'll see. Uh, you finally, you and Eric Clapton brought together again. Um, so, um, you know, the, when you talk about family and you talk about, by the way, I wanted to say one thing. My 11 year old boy uh, who plays guitar, he wants you to know it's very important that The Pretender is a much better song. He, he just likes that song best. Uh, he's not okay. saying Everlong isn't your best song. He compares The Pretender to what is and what should never be which I thought would be flattering, right? It's very flattering. Tell him I said thanks, um, man. I, I will. Um, so 
you know, family, uh, there's a scandalous moment in this book where you're touring us. You're supposed to tour Australia, as you know, and you have to cancel uh, the show and or postpone it. And I, I hate to go into this, but it's it's because of the daddy daughter dance. Correct. Absolutely correct. Yes. I mean, that so, it, that was imperative that I be at this dance and it's held once a year. Um, my, I had been taking my daughter Harper or my daughter Violet every year, and then the and then Harper was finally eligible. So now I could take both daughters to the year, and I got the date put in my calendar. And I looked, the dance is in Los Angeles, uh, and I had a show that night in Perth, Australia. So I couldn't it, I couldn't have been farther away than uh, I was halfway around the planet. And I called my manager. I said I can't do Perth. I'm sorry. Like this is, I cannot miss this dance because this is, you know, this, every father would go to this dance to kind of prove to their daughters that you can always rely on your dad. And then like what I, like, I'm going to stand up my kids at this daddy daughter. So I told my manager, I can't do Perth. He says, you got to play it. It's already sold out. I'm like, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I can't. So he moved it by a couple days and I ran off stage in Adelaide, got a plane to Sydney, Sydney to Los Angeles, was home for 12 hours, took him to the dance turned right back around, flew back to Sydney, got food poisoning on the plane, spent 15 hours in hell in the bathroom on the plane. Then as we're about to land, they hand me that embarkation card thing or whatever it is, the customs thing. But now there's an Ebola outbreak. And so you have to sign this thing that says, do you have any of these symptoms? And I had every single one of those. It was like nausea, dizziness, fever, chills and i'm just like oh my god they're gonna put me in a room full of people that have ebola i'm gonna get ebola and i'm gonna die at the airport in sydney so whatever i made my way to the stage in perth i drank a guinness i jumped up on stage for three hours we had a great show and then the next morning i flew home <laughs> uh this by the way you know the washington post one of the greatest investigative uh um units in the world and we were able to uncover this photo here which oh hey uh, look at that wow you really did research yeah I yeah mean, I, we it took a it took a team but we got that that is from the daddy daughter dance right am i correct yeah yeah i think it, there was a hawaiian theme perhaps you could tell by my shirt <laughs> that's so great and you have one more daughter now ophelia uh one more what one thing that I, I think about with family and you mentioned it it's this idea that and, and you were a fellow who was at one time terrified of having a family but um, do they love me or do they love it? Which is what you think when you're on stage or when you're at a, a, an event as a rock star. Um, and there's something different about family and finding a way to negotiate that, I'm sure as a guy who's gonna be on the road so much has been one of your main challenges in life. You seem to have figured it out. Well, I think, you know, with, say you're a musician and uh, people, dig what you do. You're kind of showered with this superficial love. It's like a sugar high. It like feels really good. And then it kind of just goes away and, and you're left feeling like, oh, was it just because I have a guitar that they, um, but when you become a father, you know, that's a whole different kind of love. That's a whole different level. And, um, and in a way, uh, it might be your first, you know, I mean, for me, it was just like, I mean, my kids, I have such a great relationship with my kids. They're so cool. They're weird and they're quirky and funky and smart and polite and funny and creative. And um, we just kind of go like this. So, um, so when I'm out on the road, it's like I can't wait to get back to that because we have fun and it's real. And I love them very much. They're very cool. Uh, Dave, you talk about this, uh, as you call it, the shared humanity of music and what it brought to you as a kid, and what it brings to the people you play for. Obviously, we've had a tough stretch here where we've been off stage for a while, now we're coming back. You've been very particular about requiring vaccinations of everybody on staff in the band, playing places where they uh, require vaccinations. Uh, so you know I've been obsessed with like Van Morrison and Eric Clapton, and what the heck is going on with those guys? Do you wanna reach out to them and just put your hands around Eric Clapton's a blues tested neck and say, Hey brother, we got to get this together. What are you doing here? You know, as we uh, like came back to start playing shows, I really felt like 
we're still in the learning beginning phases of this whole thing. Like, you know, we're not out of the woods and I don't think anybody's entirely figured it out. But when it comes to my band and my crew, you know, we try to, we, we want to make it as safe as a, of a place as possible to, um, to see the music, to listen to the music. So, you know, I think different bands have different policies and they do it different ways. And um, we just kind of do it the way that, uh, that we do it, the way that we hope keeps everyone safe. And um, I hope that we can continue to do that. And I also hope that someday um, this whole thing just kind of, that we learn how to do it together. I mean, that's what's important. When I talk about live music, it's that, it's that communal energy. Um, I wrote a piece about this last year, about the return of live music and uh, what it is about live music that human beings need. And ultimately, it's those moments where we're all together in chorus and singing, um, that tangible, communal, human element of live performance. It's what reminds us that we're not alone. So however we can do that safely, I think we should continue that on path. Dave Grohl, I would love to talk to you for six or eight hours, but the, you know, the people here are telling me it's over. Um, this book is a wonderful, wonderful book. I really hope ACDC in a bar with Paul McCartney, just go. Um, and folks, uh, for upcoming programs, uh, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Dave, thank you so much for being here and, and good luck on the remainder of this tour. Good to see you, Jeff. We'll see you around, man. Thanks, folks, uh, for coming, and uh, we'll see you next time. I'm Jeff Edgers.